of this stuff. The Rules Committee have come to order, and thank you very much for joining us uh, for another fun day at the Rules Committee, another uh, Jeb Henshelling week uh, attendance uh, policy going on today. Today, we will be considering H.R. 4061, the Financial Stability Oversight Council Improvement Act of 2017, and H.R. 4293, the Stress Test Improvement Act of 2017. Mr. Chairman, you have appeared before us this week, and you're coming to bring a series of bills that are designed to not only stimulate and help the economy, but to make sure that the very best of Americans who have ideas about forming a business or doing the things that will be necessary to make their house life better for their family have an opportunity to go and get a loan and to perform in that loan to make their life better. And that is because you are making it easier to banking. You are easy, making it easier for banks to do business and making sure that these banks, community institutions, credit unions uh, are existent and available in the communities where people live. Thank you very much for taking time out of your week to join us. We appreciate it very much. Non-banks operate differently from banks and for this reason should not be subject to the same systematic important financial institution or SIFI designated process. That's what we're talking about, trying to make it easier through regulatory easement for people and banks and non-banks to, to be available for, uh, for uh, consumers and for marketplace needs. H.R. 4061 amends the Financial Stability Act of 2010 to improve the transparency of the Financial Stability Oversight Council and to improve the SIFI designation process. This legislation provides much needed transparency and procedural fairness to the SIFI designated process for non-banks. The second bill under consideration today, H.R. 4293, reforms the comprehensive capital analysis and review process and the Dodd-Frank Act stress test process. The lack of transparency in Federal Reserve's stress tests have made it difficult for Congress, difficult for the markets, and difficult for the public to assess either the effectiveness of the Federal Reserve's regulatory oversight or the integrity of the findings that are yielded by the test. Regulators punish banks for failing to meet standards that quite honestly are never really stated nor aimed at. And this tends to be a source of uncertainty rather than a helpful guide to not only determining risk, but making sure that the benefits of that risk are well understood. This legislation benefits financial institutions by increasing transparency and accountability in the stress pest process and reducing constraints on the competitive flow of financial services that are critical to increasing economic opportunity and availability for American consumers. So we want to welcome both of you today to the Rules Committee. So without objection, I'd like to welcome the gentleman from Texas, the young chairman of the Financial Services Committee, the gentleman from Dallas, Texas, and the gentleman from Massachusetts, uh, Congressman Stephen Lynch, who we welcome to the committee. Delighted to have you today, Stephen, uh, as our first panel. So anything you have in writing, please remember that we have our awesome stenographer here today and it would help her complete the record accordingly with the benefit of having anything you brought in writing. Before we move on further, I want to yield time to the distinguished gentleman from Florida, the ranking member, for any opening comments the gentleman may have the gentleman's recognition. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wish to thank our witnesses and welcome their testimony and be prepared to go forward from there. Thank you, sir. Judge, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hensling, uh, you've taken up a good bit of time this week already uh, designating not only your time but your staff's time to the uh, ensuring that these bills are talked about in a way that would enable them to be better understood not only by members but by the public and such uh, as a policy matter would understand why it's important that we continue economic growth, economic development, more take-home pay for families, all Americans, if there's one thing that I have learned over the 20 years that I've been in Congress, it is that it, for equity to happen in our country, equity means uh, economic advantages also. 
equity is, is in lots of ways, but financially, uh, a people who get up and go to work should have a chance to make their life better and the life of their families. And I am uh, delighted that you have taken a good bit of your time this week to not only come and explain these types of concepts, but in your full support as chairman of the financial services for the House of Representatives. The gentleman is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the kind words about the work of the committee. Thank you for the kind words uh, of the staff. Uh, although it is clear, as you observed yesterday, that at least one of our staff members who now sports a rather large ring on her finger has clearly been paying attention to other matters besides banking policy, but we wish her well nonetheless. Well, she was successful, wasn't she? She was very, very successful. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the committee is in luck because of the great work the Rules Committee did yesterday. I'm expected on the floor shortly yes, to manage debate upon the uh, bills that you have previously uh, approved for the floor. So I will be brief and I will uh, jettison my opening comments and leave it for the record. I just want to say that we are here before you once again carrying two more bipartisan bills from our committee all geared towards making sure that the capital, uh, the lifeblood of our economic system flows better so that people can buy homes, they can buy cars, they can start small businesses, uh, and that we can hopefully get beyond even 3% economic growth that the Tax Cut and Jobs Act has clearly brought us and move on to something even better so more Americans can realize the American dream. Uh, H.R. 4061, the Financial Stability Oversight Council Improvement Act, simply is a due process uh, bill. Uh, it is a very, very critical matter in our committee when our regulators will designate a non-bank as essentially a too-big-to-fail institution. Uh, this uh, particular bill introduced by Representatives Ross and Delaney will help bring some greater transparency and due process to that. H.R. 4293, the Stress Test Improvement Act introduced by the gentleman from New York, Mr. Zeldin, uh, brings in some regulatory efficiencies. All banks are running stress tests all the time. Uh, but some banks have to go through incredibly cumbersome and expensive uh, stress testing, what we call the CCAR test, the DFAS test. And this bill would simply say, as opposed to doing twice a year Federal, Federal Reserve and Post test, it would be done once a year. There's also something called a qualitative aspect of the test that, frankly, there's no transparency on. Uh, and so we are trying to add greater transparency uh, to that, and we are trying to ensure that a, the Federal Reserve can't object to a bank holding company's capital plan solely based upon what they call a qualitative deficiency. We want them to have strong balance sheets. Uh, that's what we've tried to do at the committee, is make sure that we have a low regulatory burden, but we have high levels of private capital to ensure that we maximize economic growth and we minimize the opportunity for financial uh, instability. Otherwise, we streamline that test, and that's what these two bipartisan bills are about, Mr. Chairman. And since I'm expected on the floor, in fairly short order, we may do a bait and switch here, but I will yield back and be available for your questions until I have to go to the floor. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman? There ha yes, sir. If other members don't have any questions, I don't have any questions and have no objection to Mr. Ansarling uh, jettisoning himself to the floor, as well, he the, said. Well, the, the gentleman has received a gracious judicial review there, uh, and I see no need to appeal uh, further to a higher court. <laughs> Uh, Judge, thank you very much. Uh, it should be noted, Mr. Chairman, that you did notify us ahead of time, and I was aware of this problem, uh, and I did not know if Mr. Ross was planning on being up here as part of this We, 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 we hope he's on his way, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and I believe that too, so uh, unless there's another thank member you. that would wish yeah. for the gentleman. If we let him go to the floor, we get to go home where... <laughs> Yes, sir. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you for the time that you've thank given you, Mr. us Chairman, and for and your thank commitment. Thank gentleman from Florida uh, for his he, understanding. He, thank is, you. he is not only distinguished, he is a gentleman uh, above all. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Mr. Lynch, welcome to the Rules Committee. It's all yours, sir. My pleasure. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and it's good to be with you again. 
I must say I am here on behalf of our ranking member, uh, Ms. Maxine Waters of California, uh, and she has asked me to testify on her behalf and has uh, an, uh, an honor for which I am sure I am not worthy, but uh, I want to be precise in terms of the concerns that she has raised, so I will, yes, sir. I will hew rather closely to her remarks, and I apologize for that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's ironic that 10 years ago today, Bear Stearns collapsed and the Federal Reserve used taxpayer funding to arrange a shotgun wedding to J.P. Morgan to, and to avoid a catastrophe. We know now that much, much worse was to come when AIG, Lehman Brothers, the money market fund industry, and hundreds of banks, including all of the largest ones, would need a bailout from the taxpayer of the United States. And this says nothing of the tremendous damage inflicted on the millions of Americans whose homes were lost to foreclosure, the millions who lost their jobs, and the trillions of dollars of wealth that evaporated. Congress, in that instance, took decisive action to ensure that we were never caught unaware again when it passed the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. The two of the critical reforms including in the law are stress testing the largest banks to ensure that they can weather another downturn, and the authority to rein in the riskiness of non-banks like Bear Stearns before they become so big and interconnected that their failure requires a taxpayer bailout. It's for this reason that I think the American public shares my disappointment and disgust that on this tragic 10th anniversary, this committee would consider two bills that would make a repeat of the 2008 disaster more likely. The first bill, H.R. 4061, the Financial Stability Oversight Council Improvement Act, would recklessly complicate the process used by the Financial Stability Oversight Council, or FSOC, to designate non-bank firms for heightened oversight and to better protect the economy. This bill will give companies many more avenues to delay by at least four years or, in some cases, completely block these designations. According to former Treasury Secretary Jack Lew, who strongly opposed this bill in the last Congress, quote, an excessively long four-year process to designated large complex firms that pose significant risk to financial system, our financial system, is not an improvement. Instead, it would effectively render meaningless one of the most important tools we and future councils should have to address threats to financial stability, close quote. The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office confirmed this view, finding that H.R. 4061 would increase the risk that systemic non-bank firms that have not been designated will fail. And please let me be very clear, this bill is a thinly veiled attempt to hinder and needlessly delay FSOC's existing ability to designate firms for heightened oversight. Americans for Financial Reform have underscored that the bill would, quote, provide giant global financial firms numerous opportunities to use insider lobbying and the courts to delay or prevent actions that banking regulators are attempting to take to safeguard national economic stability, close quote. I simply cannot support a bill that would add hurdles to prevent FSOC from fulfilling its vital role of identifying interconnected huge companies like Bear Stearns, AIG, or Lehman Brothers that warrant enhanced safeguards to make sure that these firms can never again devastate the stability of our financial system and jeopardize our country's strong economy. Next, I would like to discuss our concerns with H.R. 4293, the Stress Test Improvement Act, so-called. Contrary to the title of the bill, the bill would not improve the existing stress test process, but would actually undermine it. In addition to annual tests administered by the Federal Reserve, large financial institutions are required to pre prepare semi-annual reports demonstrating their ability to withstand financial distress, which is referred to as stress testing. And just to be clear, we're talking about Citigroup, Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and other mega banks. Dodd-Frank's capital and stress testing mandates have, according to credit rating agencies and financial analysts, strengthened our country's financial system by requiring banks to increase their capital by more than $750 billion. That is $750 billion in high-quality capital that banks can and do safely lend and invest in their communities. In fact, since Dodd-Frank passed, banks have increased lending to businesses by over 80%. Yet H.R. 4293 would reduce the obligation for institutions to conduct these valuable semi-annual reports about their ability to withstand stressful conditions to 
to just once a year. In addition, the bill would eliminate the adverse scenario from, from Fed-run stress tests. Testing multiple scenarios helps better prepare institutions for different kinds of unexpected stressful scenarios, whether they are medium or large in scale. Most troubling, the bill would make it harder for regulators to object to a megabank's capital plan. Given the stakes and how quickly economic ties can shift, robust semi-annual stress tests by the largest banks are simply good sense. According to Third Way, quote, if we had stress tests before the financial crisis, we could have been prepared to take action before the chain reaction of bank failures unfolded, close quote. And according to CBO, this bill would lead to a higher risk of bank failures. So I urge members of this committee to not forget the economic devastation wrought on our economy and reject H.R. 4061 and H.R. 4293, and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Lynch, thank you for being here, and it's, uh, it is very um, fair, I think, to say that necessarily your party or necessarily my party agree on economic uh, uh, use of economics in, in, in American life, whether it be politics, whether it be policy, whether it be day-to-day -day living. But I do take to heart what you say about making sure, whether you said it or not, that we have a secure, sound system. And I do take it at heart to understand that we should always, every member of this body, not empower ourselves or anyone else to make decisions that might be in their own self-interest but against a policy or against the best interest of the country. With that said, I know that based upon the circumstances that we had in 08, it was politically volatile time. Uh, there was a, a political demand to raise taxes, a political demand to do a lot of things and perhaps to take the country down a different pathway. We are now in what I would say not the reverse of that, but we're in a perspective where a direction has been decided, a new direction that equals uh, taxes for businesses that have greatly changed the marketplace, moved us to 3% or more GDP growth per year, lowest unemployment in 17 years, take home pay 2.6% when we went through some 11 or 12 years where it had been flat. We now seemingly have turned some corner, whether it be politically, policy-wise, or the growth of the country. And I would say to you, thank you. I do hear what you're saying. We are not talking past each other. I'm saying to you that I believe that it's important for us to make sure that we give the free enterprise system the full measure of the gas that it's getting to not only grow the economy, but really to make sure that business and small business gets what it needs for capital to continue in a growth period of time. And with great respect, I will tell you, I do need to listen to you. Your words of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, wisdom are there. What I would say to you back is, and it's either a question you can take or not is, but I think we've turned a corner and we're trying to let everybody in the economy grow, not just the biggest banks, not just people that have a job, not just people that might have more than ten dollars or $100,000 in their pocket, but actually many new people who the first time are going to college. They're first person in their family. They're going to medical school. They're going to law school. They're going to trade schools. And stand a chance where there's a demand for work. And I just want you to know that I want those people, wherever they live, to find a credit union, a small bank, a community bank, a heck, a big bank, but somewhere where they can go. And we're trying to encourage the free enterprise system. But what it does is it encourages first time people who now can take advantage of these things 
without calling it uh, safety and soundness, but to call it wise policy. Yes, sir. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I don't disagree necessarily with what you, you've just said. Here, here's here's the, the crux of it, though, and, and we were both there in 2008, so, and I, I, I've continued to vote against the bailout. I, I voted against the bailout. I didn't think it was right that people in my district or in Texas, uh, taxpayers, some of people in my district don't even have a bank account, and yet their tax money was, was used to bail out Goldman Sachs and a whole other bunch of big banks. Here, here's the problem. The last time the banks were able to take the risk and socialize the cost, they, they pushed the cost out on the taxpayer. And the idea here is that we want to retain those provisions that we put in place to make sure that that doesn't happen again, that we internalize the losses so that banks have to, you know, govern themselves in a way that they realize if, if they take these crazy risks, it's on them. It's on their, their shareholders and not on the, the general public. So that's why the stress tests are there, just to make sure they don't engage in this risky behavior that gets them in trouble. And, you know, it, it's tough to predict where the economy is going to go next. You know, all, all we know is at some point there'll be a downturn. It's just the cyclical nature of, of uh, our economy. And if things go really bad, we don't want the American taxpayer to have to pick up the tab for these bankers who are doing enormously well. I mean, all these all these stocks are up. They're 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 doing great, and and uh, you know that can change in a hurry, though. And we just want to have a plan in place when it does. That's the uh, good counterbalance. I think if we stay where we are we don't make it to 4%. I think that if we keep the capital requirements and the requirements that are for the reserves, where we have literally hundreds of billions of dollars set aside, what we're doing is arbitrarily keeping back people that might have a good idea. And there's that balance. This is why we respect. Well, and I think why you and I are in full agreement yeah. Somebody could be right, and somebody's not wrong, or somebody's not wrong, maybe somebody's right, but I, it's a guess to try and bring along to reduce regulatory burdens yeah. so that people might make wise choices and decisions. And Yes, sir. Well, I, I just I just see the, uh, you know, the $750 billion in, in high-quality reserves uh, uh, as insurance. That's insurance that, that's going to cushion the downturn, rather than using $750 billion from the American taxpayer. I would rather have the banks that are extremely, that are extremely do, doing really well and, and they're taking that necessary steps and doing the stress tests. That's a layer of protection so that we don't put the taxpayers of Texas or Massachusetts, again, in that, that same jackpot that they were in in 2008. I, you know what? I think you and I really agree. Uh, we have a gentleman here from a company called Vermeer Equipment. And they are a uh, company that, by and large, takes this large equipment, road building, uh, heavy equipment for mines, big, big, moving big things. And they're uh, essentially a lot of their employees met with me and said, we offer you know, lots of things, but people can rent our equipment if they can't buy it, but they can get it and compete because if they couldn't go buy something big, they could at least lease it for a period of time to be competitive in a marketplace. The market, in other words, I don't, if, if they needed big equipment for a short period of time, but not normally, they get a chance to go get that. I think the market has changed and it, what is dominant now is choices where people can compete big guys little guys small business larger business because of the marketplace that's so dynamic equipment is now available there are these chances to do that and i think this is part of that it might be a risk to some bank to loan some money to loan equipment to loan something but if they can come up and prove they can do it it's available as opposed to saying no. And I just, um, I'm going to err on the side of saying I want everybody to be able to have a shot at equity, and equity is fairness and money also, and I appreciate you being here. Thank you.
gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Collins. Mr. Collins does not seek time. The gentleman, distinguished gentleman. Thank you very Mr. much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the uh, dialogue uh, that you and Mr. Lynch just had is what should be um, uh, being done uh, in hearings um, in this committee. This now, uh, this week marks uh, 30 um, financial services uh, uh, bills dealing with regulation that have been brought to this committee, including um, uh, the ones uh, that we are dealing with this week. Uh, 15 of those um, uh, rules were closed rules. Um, only of the uh, 30 that we have dealt with thus far, only two of them had uh, hearings. Um, and so 93% then of all of, of these measures did not go through regular order. Um, and I, I, I think that's wrong. Mr. Lynch pointed out that you and he um, uh, were here in 2008. Um, I was as well when Secretary Paulson came here. It was one of the scariest moments. I remember the that, day. I remember it just as if it were yesterday, and it was extremely scary. He came over here with two and a quarter pieces of paper um, uh, just uh, four or five days before the entire economy uh, was uh, likely uh, to collapse. And so we went into overdrive, and we did all the things uh, that were necessary, but we could avert some of this discussion. Mr. Lynch comes from the territory. He knows uh, uh, Dodd. He knows Barney Frank, and he knows the amount of energy that they put into trying to place in, in place in this country um, the ability not to have uh, the same things happen. So I have a question for you, Mr. Lynch. Sure. Um, we've seen these bills uh, uh, come uh, from the committee that you're privileged uh, uh, to serve, and most of them chipping away at Dodd-Frank. Taken together, what is your assessment as to whether or not they could um, uh, put us at risk of another financial crisis? Uh, thank you for the question. I don't need to rely on my opinion. Uh, you know, the Congressional Budget Office has said this will make it more likely these banks will fail. Uh, and this takes away uh, FSOC's ability. And these are the, these are the key regulators of our financial system. This takes away the tools that they would have. Uh, it allows these banks that are we very well resourced to delay by four years any action that our regulators might want to take to prevent a bank from putting itself in a dangerous situation. So, uh, and in some cases, they may be able to put off a designation in perpetuity. Uh, so we will never be able to call them uh, to task. Uh, I think a lot of the American people are very upset that in that whole mess from 2008 that nobody went to jail. Yeah. We, we, we lost trillions of dollars in wealth. People lost their homes. Oh. I remember in my district, uh, you know, I did one of those uh, uh, town hall meetings. And uh, we brought enough material for about 100 people, figuring and these were people who were losing their homes. And uh, at Randolph High School in my district, and we ended up with 450 families there that morning. I was overwhelmed. And uh, all those families, very nervous, because they had, they had been given subprime mortgages uh, in that area. So uh, I remember very, very well. Some of those families are just now getting to that point where they were in 2008. They've... they've all this time. Right. Let, me, uh, let me ask you this. Um, you were on the committee um, uh, when um, uh, we had the financial crisis. Um, in the run-up to Dodd-Frank, um, after uh, uh, that period, and in the run-up to its passage, did you all hold hearings? Oh, yeah, extensive hearings. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I like both of you, like the chairman and, and yourself, I remember when Paulson and uh, Bernanke and others came, came to the committee and said, uh, well, the first time they came before our committee, they said, we got this under control. This is, don't worry about this. Then they came back a week later and they said, uh, 
well, we, we, we think we're going to be able to get out of this and don't worry. And then the third time they came back, you know, they were looking for money for, for a bailout to mm -hmm. try to save the bank. So, uh, you know, they didn't have the tools back then to deal with this, and we put them in place. Uh, Congressman Frank and, and Senator Dodd put them in place, and, and now here we are 10 years later with, uh, you know, a, ba a bad case of... Uh, uh, amnesia and, and with respect to what happened. So then you all had hearings uh, with uh, 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 experts and others appearing oh. before you pro and con. Dozens of measures. hearings, yeah. Sure. Right. Then it would seem to me only logical uh, that um, a certain number of hearings ought be held to undo what was done and uh, with there being uh, very little um, uh, done uh, then to me um, I, I, I find it particularly troubling, and I think that's one of the things um, uh, that people in America dislike about Congress uh, in its current form, and that is the inability uh, to allow for uh, the uh, uh, public input and to hear from experts. And so what it looks like now to me is that um, uh, Chairman Hensarling, who I genuinely like, um, and uh, the Republican majority, uh, uh, the figureheads uh, for undoing legislation that heard from lots of people throughout the country. And uh, uh, toward that end, uh, well, just one final comment from me. I, for the life of me, do not understand why two um, uh, uh, biennial, biannual stress tests um, uh, for banks uh, that are large banks is so problematical. And I asked Mr. Hensarling and Ms. Waters yesterday whether there are any of the large banks that are losing money. And not a damn one of them is losing money. All of them are making money hand over fist. And when, that's when they were doing the stress test, whether they were two or how many. So I don't buy into that argument other than they're unleashing them. And at some point, what it's going to cause is for us to go right back into the same kind of posture that we were in where a considerable amount of individual wealth was lost. Now, the people at the top, they didn't lose nothing. That business that Chairman um, Sessions was talking about that needs that ability to be able to get uh, capital, I promise you, we pass these things, they ain't going to get no quicker opportunity to have capital than they did before. It's a big boy's game uh, that we play here, and that's to the detriment of a number of things that we ought be dealing with. We ought to be doing DACA. We ought to be doing gun measures of uh, consequence. Uh, and here we are quibbling and nibbling and chipping away at something that was put in place to try to help people not have the kind of collective crisis that we experienced in this country. With that, Mr. Lynch, you I, have something else you were going to well, say? Well, th th thank you. And I, and I agree every, with everything the gentleman has said. Uh, and I would also point out that uh, unlike the dozens of hearings that we had with uh, experts from every uh, angle and, and every part of the financial services industry, uh, we had one hearing on, on this that wow. came up, one hearing. That was it. Wow. And that was for a number of bills. So uh, we've had very little discussion, unfortunately. And I, and I do believe, believe proceeding with such little preparation and, and, and forethought is, is reckless, especially when we know what the consequences may be. And it becomes inside baseball, and that's what I think the American people don't like. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I yield back. Yes, sir, Judge. Thank you very much. The uh, distinguished gentleman from Alabama. I have a question, Mr. Gentleman does not seek time. The distinguished gentleman from uh, Happy Valley, Happy... No, freedom is, freedom is the other gentleman. Uh, Happy Valley, where, where's home? No, what? Are, no, come on now. Sunnyside. Look, I was gone last week. Sunnyside, Washington. It is a, I've been there. I just didn't remember where I was. The gentleman does not seek time. Thank you very much. The uh, gentleman from Colorado. No further questions. gentleman does not seek time. Mr. Lynch, we've had, uh, uh, an opportunity today to not only hear from you uh, about the reminders from our past, but also to know where I think where not only you are, but perhaps your party. And it is always important for us to hear from you. 
I think it's important for us to share ideas. And uh, Stephen, I think you know how much I admire you. And I thank you for taking time to be here. Well, that goes today. both ways, Mr. Chairman. And I thank you for your courtesy uh, to me today. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Is there any other member that would uh, seek to give testimony today before the committee for H.R. 4061, H.R. 4293? Seeing none, this now closed the hearing portion, and the chairman will be in receipt of a motion from the distinguished gentleman from Georgia. The gentleman, Mr. Collins, is recognized. A motion for H.R. 4061 and H.R. 4293, Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 4061, the Financial Stability and Oversight Council Improvement Act of 2017, a close rule. The rule will provide one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Financial Services. The rule weighs all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of Rules Committee Print 115-64 modified by the amendment printed in Part A of the Rules Committee Report shall be considered as adopted and the bill as amended shall be considered as read. The rule weighs all points of order against the provisions in the bill as amended. The rule provides for one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Section 2 of the rule provides for consideration of H.R. 4293, the Stress Test Improvement Act of 2017 under a closed rule. The rule provides for one hour debate equally divided controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Financial Services, the rule weighs all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of Rules Committee Print 115-63 modified by the amendment printed in Part B of the Rules Committee Report shall be considered as adopted and the bill as amended shall be considered as read. The rule weighs all points of order against provisions in the bill as amended. Finally, the rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Thank you very much. You've heard the motion from the distinguished gentleman from uh, Georgia. Is there a amendment or discussion to that? No, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Seeing none, the uh, vote now be on the motion from the distinguished gentleman from Georgia. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Accordingly, uh, the gentleman from uh, Freedom, Colorado, will be handling this for Republicans. I'm happy about it. And I will be handling it and for the And the distinguished majority. gentleman from Florida will be handling this for Democrats. Mr. Chairman, we've yes, finished, finished for the week. Yes, sir. This does, is this does is your our, uh, reconnaissance allow that there's discussion about Friday or whether or not we're going to be here? Yes, sir. And that's a very good question. As you and I both know, this committee needs to do its work. We're waiting for that product that would be delivered to us on behalf of uh, what might be the Senate and the House negotiation by our appropriators who need, want, and need to fund the government uh, for the remainder of the year. I am uh, <coughs> I'm here to report at this time that we do not have an answer. Okay. And uh, as we brief, I'm story, betting on kicking the can down the road. Well, that's a dangerous can to kick, as the gentleman knows. Uh, what we're trying to do, as the gentleman knows, is find agreement. An agreement beats kicking the can down the road, and oh, sometimes sure. measuring three times instead of twice, uh, sometimes you can get closer on that avenue. Both you and I understand, understand the difficulties, but also the opportunities and advantages. So, Judge, I would just ask that each of us be prepared and ready. Gotcha. Uh, I would promise, as I did yesterday, my promise I think is still good today, and that is as soon as we know. receive data or information, meaning we know we're going to post, we'll immediately tell you, uh, and we would expect to work together uh, on whatever that answer is. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate your help very much. Is there anything further from uh, any other member of the committee? Thank you very much. I'd like to make one announcement if I can. You know, from time to time we have people that come and visit. In this case, it's uh, the Coxes from Keller, Texas. And the Coxes uh, have an opportunity to be here. Jack is the baby. Jack. Jack wasn't sure if he wanted to come in here. Mary was sure she wanted to. Ellie was very fired up about this. But Amy and Champ Cox, thank you for taking time to bring your family, not just to Washington, but in particular to come to the Rules Committee, uh, where your second favorite member of Congress uh, gets to, to be, and your first favorite, uh, Mike Burgess, just could not be here right now. But Dr. Burgess is alive and well and, and doing great. And that's Mr. Ken Buck from Colorado, Freedom Colorado. That's right there. Uh, but we want to thank you, uh, Champ, for what you do. Uh, working for Vermeer Equipment Company in Irving, Texas, means you have a chance every year to see me at your barbecue, uh, where I come out and judge. We, 
we have this barbecue before a cowboy game. You know what that's like. I never miss it. So uh, to the Coxes, thank you very much for bringing your beautiful family with us. We appreciate it. Uh, this committee has now completed its work for the day. Thank you very much. <laughs>